Welcome all to today's service, where we look at the question, how will you tell the story of 2020 to future generations? It is a question without a simple answer. As we begin a new year, we offer this service as a space to pause, breathe, and reflect on how you were impacted and transformed from the year past, personally and communally. May we, we rest in a divine sense of wonder within, beside, and all around us as we move forward with our service today. Sorry. First, we invite you to sing along with a song I think you'll all recognize, We Shall Overcome. Um, this version was sung in 1967 by the great American folk singer Pete Seeger, and he's leading a group of young people in Berlin, Germany. I don't know why, but it's, it's a great recording. It was a different era, but the song's message resonates with the story of 2020.
Now, I offer an excerpt from the poem Narrative Theology Number no. One by, Ta by Padraig Otuma. He's a contemporary Irish poet and theologian who's worked as a mediator and led a community of reconciliation in Northern Ireland. And I said to him, are there answers to all of this? And he said, the answer is in a story and the story is being told. And I said, but there's so much pain and she answered plainly, pain will happen. Then I said, will I ever find meaning? And they said, you will find meaning where you give meaning. The answer is in a story and the story isn't finished. And now I'd like to offer you um, a, a story. Um, a number of years ago, I was camping with my family in Baxter Preserve when a pot of boiling water fell from the camping stove onto my lap. The result was an immediate end to our camping adventure and two legs that were heavily bandaged. My summer plans changed immediately from plans of traveling abroad and preparing for a half marathon to sitting mostly and walking slowly with an awkward shuffle. But the body is amazing, my legs healed quickly, and what was left was modest scarring. At the summer's end, I was prepared to return to my job as a teacher when I met with my mentor to look at the year ahead. When I shared with him my story about a very different summer than I had planned, he considered me and then gave me the gift of a metaphor that I would like to pass on to all of you today. He helped me see that I had gone into the fire and had been shaped from the experience in a similar way to how, to how iron and some form of steel are put into hot flames in the forging of a sword. My body had changed the heat of the experience, but I had changed inwardly as well. The sword I carried that all my truth, integrity, and essence was bound up in had become stronger. Since then, I have used this metaphor to help me relate to experiences where I have felt the rise of the heat of the fire inside me, whether it was stoked from anger, love, illness, or pain. In many ways, I feel that last year was a year with the world on fire. Sometimes the flames have felt so hot that the sword I am forging has felt brittle. But other times love of family and community has burned beautifully white hot so that my sword again became flexible and strong. I would like to offer this metaphor to you now as a way to help integrate some of your experiences of the past year. I invite you to close your eyes as you imagine the forging of your sword. To forge your sword, you will first need your metal. Choosing the right metal is the most important part of making a good blade. A good choice might be iron in some form of steel or perhaps a blend of courage and humility. It is your choice. The sword you are forging is your own. The process of forging your sword will require a great many tools and elements. Look within yourself for the following things. A sturdy hammer and anvil, sand, water, fire, and air, your bellow, your breath. It is with each breath that your fire is stoked or cooled. You will also need to find a space for your forging. Perhaps you have an obvious space where forging can take place, or maybe your first step is to find it. Search deep inside of yourself for a cavernous space that can bear the heat. Finally, time. This forging will take time. With these tools and elements at hand's reach, the forging begins. Your metal is placed in the heat of your fire. Soon your material will be hot enough 
that it will become malleable. You will know your material, material is malleable through a great variety of cues. You may feel it glowing orange or red or white within you, or you may feel a sensation of suppleness, softness, or a sense of yielding. When this moment arrives, the shaping begins. Your material is shaped by the weight of your hammer. As your hammer hits the iron and steel of your blade, you may feel the sting of the blows reverberate through your whole body. You may feel great pain in each blow, or maybe your hammer strikes its target easily, naturally, in complete flow. As you are shaping your sword, you'll begin a dance of dropping it into the fire and then back to your anvil to pound some more. Slowly, your sword will take shape. You will know when your sword has taken its shape. When it has, put it back in the flames. Now quiet your breath, let the fellow rest, sit back and wait for the flames to die down with your blade within them. Slowly, the heat of the fire and your sword will cool together, bound to one another. When your sword has cooled, take it in your hands. Use your sand to clean the blade. Look at your blade and notice the intricate design that was made. No two blades will ever come out the same. The swords we forge are bound to the fires of our lives. They may change in shape or fluctuate between sharpness and dullness, flexibility and brittleness, and even if broken, can be sealed again through the fire. What will remain unchanged is the material, the metal of your character, the canvas of your being. For me, it is my sword that, that helps me cut through webs of fiery thoughts and emotions to help me see and interpret my experiences. The memories I carry and the stories I tell are brought to life through the integrity and truth of my words and actions, which are guided by the tilt of my sword. As we step out of one fiery year and into another, may you courageously embrace your fires with your sword raised in the fullness of your heart. I would now like to invite you to sit for a moment of silence with your sword. It will be um, about two minutes. So I will ring the, a chime to mark the beginning and the end of this of this space.
2020 was without a doubt a fiery year, and the embers are still burning hot. We have all seen how a gust of wind can reignite the flames. What an invitation to forge our own sword through these times, with the metal of our character from the fires around and within us. This year was one of paradoxes, as striking as a red flame heating up until it burns an icy blue. There is the paradox of having the daily mundane stripped from our lives, only to realize how stabilizing these routine practices are. The paradox of 25 faces and cubes overwhelming you on your computer screen and still feeling lonely because you're not able to look a single one of them directly in the eye. The paradox of social distancing to stay physically safe while feeling the heavy psychological and emotional tolls of isolation. There is also the paradox of honoring the struggles of others while feeling joy in your own life and suffering while still acknowledging privilege. A great paradox we all faced was how inextricably connected the pandemic demonstrated our lives to be, even while it revealed how painfully different our realities are along economic and social disparities, and economic and racial social disparities. Howard Thurman, a renowned Afro-American theologian, offered spiritual guidance to the nonviolent civil rights movement as a key mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In one of his many writings, he offers, you can't stand in the midst of the world and struggle for fundamental change unless you are standing in your own space and looking for change within. Rebecca talks about the period in the forging of our sword when we slow our breath to let the bellows rest. In that quiet, how do we listen for the stories of those whose voices have been oppressed by the roar of dominant culture? Are we afraid of what we may hear? How does it feel in our bodies to bow in humility to the truth of their stories? How do we hold the tension of conflicting stories with graceful discernment? Moving through my own chime journey amidst 2020, I'm beginning to ask a question I never have before. What spiritual practices must I cultivate to nurture a steadfast connection to the divine? It is that connection for me, that fire glowing orange, that will soften the brittle parts of my blade, offering me a sensation of suppleness and a sense of yielding, as Rebecca so beautifully described. And in that cavernous quiet to which we can always return, there also comes a time to re-energize the bellows. To this, Howard Thurman writes, it's a wondrous thing that decision to act releases energy in the personality. For days on end, a person may drift along without much energy, having no particular sense of direction and having no will to change. Then something happens to alter the pattern. It may be something very simple and inconsequential in itself, but it stabs awake, it alarms, it disturbs. In a flash, one gets a vivid picture of oneself, and it passes. The result is decision, sharp, definitive decision. In the wake of the decision, yes, even as part of the decision itself, energy is released. The act of decision sweeps all before it, and the life of the individual may be changed forever. In reflecting on Howard Thurman's words, we wonder what is the action to which 2020 has called us? Innumerable faith traditions, particularly those mystic branches, remind us that action 
can look very different than what we are accustomed to. Are we ready to be transformed? How do we nurture spirit within and around us to accompany us in this transformation? If there is one paradox I hold dear from this year, it is the realization of how fallible we all are while witnessing how resilient we have the capacity to be. We want to offer a song that found us while we were planning the service. The artists are singing in a church that as recently as the 1960s did not allow worshipers of their skin color. We ask ourselves, how many candles were lit in 2020? How many eyes opened in seeking and closed in reverence? How many hands folded in front of hearts? How many heads bowed? While you listen to this music, we will show a few images of the singers, and we hope you'll notice their prayerful positions. Perhaps your body will recognize itself in one of these postures. We invite you to respond to the spirit by singing or taking any posture of worship that moves you. May the music reverberate into parts of you that words don't touch. Should all acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should all acquaintance be forgot and days of old
in this moment before Anne's closing memories and benediction, we want to invite you to consider making a donation of any size to support the work and dreams of CHIME. Um, you'll find the Chaplaincy Institute of Maine website online. Go there and click on Give. You can contribute or send a check to the address given. We appreciate your support. In 25 years, if I survive the pandemic, a day might come when a young face will turn to me and ask, what was it like to live through 2020? How will I describe it? I can give the bare facts. More than 300,000 Americans, nearly 2 million people worldwide died from a virus. 8,889,297 acres of land in the American West went up in flames. One terrible outcome of our troubled relationship with the natural world. More than 10,000 protests across the country announced the rebirth of a powerful social movement led by people of different backgrounds and skin colors demanding the end to racial injustice in our country. And a presidential election brought relief and joy, but also anger and doubt. My personal story though will be to tell of a year spent close to home it will include things that woke me with dread in the night and things that glisten in my memory as holy moments. It will include the fragments and flashbacks that shape my ordinary life in an extraordinary year, such as these. Nine and a half months of hovering outside my mother's apartment like a bee unable to get to a flower. Wedding cancellations falling like cold rain the soaring red line tracking unemployment, agonizing daily statistics showing COVID ripping through nursing homes, Native American communities, low income neighborhoods, and my own sweet state. Phone conversations with friends hunkered down in cities at a standstill, silent streets, stages, subways, newspaper stands, places where people usually rub shoulders, exchange handshakes, worship, share food and laugh, suddenly empty. Endless washing, groceries, masks and hands, and oceans of hand sanitizer. Scientists sharing research across, across countries and whole continents to create life-saving vaccines faster than the speed of light. Doctors and nurses dying from their devotion. Clanging pans and ringing bells to honor them. Songs unfurling from windows in Bergamo, Italy. Lifting hearts through darkness. People hugging through plastic curtains. Touching through windows. The steady and somehow unbeat, um, upbeat voice of Dr. Nirav Shah director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention on the radio, the birth of a beautiful grandchild, the death of a dear friend, Zoom meetings with cameos by dogs and cats and ebullient children and restless homebound teenagers, pandas mating for the first time in the serenity of a closed Chinese zoo, Christmas in quietude, looking at the stars, lighting candles, saying prayers. Vivid red-orange scenes of fires devouring the West, my children's calls from smoke-strangled Oregon and California. I can't stay here any longer. A drop in fossil fuel emissions proving that human behavior can change life on Earth. Summer protests, Americans against Americans, wrestling with cruelties of the past and the present, all asking in their own way, who do we want to be as one nation under God? 
November text threads scanning back and forth within my family, young and old cheering each other on as they make calls to get out to vote. Technology bringing people together, technology breaking people apart, doubt, lies, and fear, trust, truth, and bravery, and the realization that we can day after day, week after week, month after month, in a familiar place, discover worlds within worlds, fall into wonder, and meet mystery face to face. A young person may come to you one day asking for your 2020 story. Think about what was important to you. Write down what you remember now while it's fresh in your heart. Telling your stories is a way to lay last year's events on an altar and honor the wisdom you gained. As poet Otuma wrote, you will find meaning where you give meaning. And don't forget that storytelling is a two-way encounter. Be ready to listen as well as speak. Otuma notes that the story isn't finished. Future generations will craft their own versions of the year we just lived through but we must tell what we know so that old and young can create history and the future together. We'll close with a prayer. God, help us see ourselves in every story. We are the newborn baby insistent on living and the dying elder knowing each breath could be our last. We are the person who doesn't look like us, talk like us, think like us, pray like us. We are the liar and the saint, the Republican, the Republican and the Democrat, the demonstrator and the police officer. We are the rabbit leaping lightly over new snow and the high up hawk hungry for the rabbit. We are the oak tree, holding still in the cold till spring and the sleeping sea that will reach toward light. We are each other's dreams and disappointments. We are ocean and sky, star and river, field and forest, friend and foe. We are small and we are part of an infinite mystery. This is our story. Amen. We would like to close with a song um, that tells another story. It is presented by the children and faculty of the Bay School in Blue Hill, Maine.
If anyone would like to linger, to connect, or ask questions about CHIME, you're invited to stay after. Thank you for joining us for our service today. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for a lovely service. What a wonderful way to start this day. Um, I'm very touched by the creativity and the, the way that you, each of you were able to um, reflect not only your own story, but on the stories of one another. Um, how wonderful, how wonderful to hear you and um, in the way that CHIME has touched you this year. I graduated in 2014 and I never, I never cease to be amazed by uh, coming and worshiping with all of you. So thank you, thank you and blessings. Thank you, Annie. I just want to say thank you so much um, and Annie you put that very well and I'm, this is going to be a, um, a recording that I'm going to be sharing because it's just so poignant and deep and beautiful so thank you so much for your uh, for being here thank you Chris thank you for being here I want to apologize to Hadley and Rebecca for for not unmuting myself in the very beginning. <laughs> oh, well. Relatively few technology glitches. <laughs> I just wanna thank you. That was beautiful beyond words. And there leaves me with so much to kind of reflect on and I'm really just blown away by the way you connected the dots. So thank you so much. Thanks for coming, Terry. <laughs> it truly was a stunning service and, uh, and I was deeply touched. Obviously I cried. So I'll share it with my children. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Jane. Thank you, Jane. It was a beautiful service. I, I was hiding in the background for much of it um, because I've got to get out the door shortly, but I, I was listening and, and watching. Um, uh, it just flowed so nicely all the pieces fit together perfectly and um i just want to thank you all you did a, a a really great job thank you so nice to see you me too i miss you all <laughs> thank you for such a heartfelt service and i'm working on my sword right now <laughs> <laughs> thank great chris it's wonderful to see you two on the same screen. <laughs> I'm very, very grateful for your service. It was so creative and yet so grounding. And I can't wait to get to my journal today because I'm going to tell my story. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm gonna to touch the side of the screens here so I can touch you all. <laughs> and maybe you can touch the side of your screen so we can all connect. Well done. Yes, I feel it. I feel the energy. <laughs> I'm outside of the box. <laughs> Thank you so much to each of the three of you. Um, 
And I just wanted to say, I was so amazed how I really, um, how you melded so beautifully your own personal voices um, in writing and in speaking and in prayer. And you also wove in so many beautiful voices from the earth and from other communities and outside of Maine and the winds and the fire and it just was all here. And it's, um, it really, really was so touching and I, I'm very, very grateful. And I, I just, um, yeah, you, you really gave us all a gift today. Thank you. Holly, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> So Hadley, we're sitting here at Burt Lake watching the snow finally fall in Michigan. And there couldn't be a better way than to watch the service you created and enjoy Burt Lake at the same time. Congratulations. Great job, everyone. Thank you for being here, Mom and Dad. Yeah, you know those people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> don't ask them how they know me. Those stories don't need to emerge. You two out there, you 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 birds, the star. <laughs> I know I'm going to carry the image of my sword right here, <laughs> and when something hard happens, I can welcome it a little more easily that way. So, thank you for all the reflections and grounding. I was lying on the ground with my eyes closed for most of it, and it was just such a beautiful 45 minutes of experience. So, thank you. Thank you, Lizzie, and thank you for being our text guru <laughs> to help <laughs> with all the Zoom things. <laughs> That's critical in today's world. <laughs> hmm. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm checking out because I'm going to go chase the squirrel from the bird feeder. <laughs> first things first. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you all. Um, so I am a, a graduate of the One Spirit Learning Alliance in New York City. Um, and I moved to Maine two years ago. So I have been um, looking forward to trying to uh, connect with the Chime community. Um, and the people involved. So this was a lovely introduction to the community here and I'm, I'm eager to learn more about Chime and, and the people that participate in it. Also nice. Nice to have a newcomer. Yes. <laughs> Great. I hope we'll see more of you. I hope so too. Wonderful. Back here is by Kat, by Terry. Bye, Anne. Bye, Tamara. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I want to say goodbye. You helped me cry. Thank you. I appreciate that. Love, this. Love you all. Bye. Have a lovely day. <laughs>